Welcome to HIV Hope and Charity, a podcast series brought to you by TVPS, a charity that's been supporting people affected by HIV since 1985. I'm Sarah. And I'm Jess and we work for TVPS and our aim is to get as many people as possible HIV educated. If you like the podcast, please rate, subscribe and leave us a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. Right. HIV hero or history oh i started talking i started talking when you started it right start again edit all of that out i can't i was in the middle of the jingle i know you're not gonna sing it with me i don't know the words how rude okay where was i every week we have to solve this mystery a event or a person sarah will describe if you like our podcast you better subscribe did you like the dance i did as well i did are you actually including this in the podcast (laughs) Yes. Oh, okay, fine, fine. Well, welcome to HIV Hope and Charity Heroes Edition. Well, Heroes and History Edition. This is, yeah, I thought this was a history edition. What a lovely way to start with that jingle. Beautiful. Well, you, you you wanted a jingle, so I feel like you can't complain until you bring me another one. Okay, I am working on it. Okay, good. It's like jingle top trumps. Okay. <laughs> well, just, and, and then when you've done one, I'll try and outdo yours. Okay, oh, I like that. Well, I am quite competitive, so this this could work well. You are. Are you using musical instruments, can I ask? Uh, I'm probably going to assemble a band, if I'm being honest. Okay, okay, but it has to be you that writes music and lyrics. You can't be commissioning other people. Well, no, I think I'll use your lyrics and just put them to music. Oh, okay, I like it. So we'll always use the same lyric, but we'll just up the stakes. I did hear that you said your son had a steel drum, so I expect big things. A miniature one, and we have got a keyboard. Sounds so rubbish. We've got a keyboard and a mini steel drum. It's going to be great. And a ukulele. You got a ukulele for Christmas. Oh, that's quite cool. Yeah. There you go. So I've pretty much. And you've got enough members of your family in your household mm-hmm. for each instrument you on lead vocals. Yeah. No, I'm not going to. Uh, okay. Right. You can anyway, speak it along to the tune. We'll see how it goes. Fair enough. So this week, right. I thought we'd do a nice calm. Well, it's not calming podcast. What am I talking? Never is calming, is it? When it's us too. But National HIV Testing Week being done, busy, busy times. We need to relax ourselves and have what better way to do it than talking about film? And you know how much of a film buff I am. I mean, is it about Bridget Jones gets pregnant or whatever it's called? No. <laughs> If I could find a way to link that to HIV Heroes in History, I would. <laughs> I bet there's like a really tenuous link. That you... I will find it, yeah, definitely. No, this week we're going to look um, at quite an iconic film. It is going to be Philadelphia. Awesome. Okay, yeah, cool. So do you remember watching Philadelphia? I have watched it. Okay, was it when you were much younger or? Yes, it was. Yeah, much younger. Yeah, me and too. The thing is, you know me, I find certain episodes of Friends quite harrowing. So anything like that, I it's you know, it's like when I watched It's a Sin and I couldn't get past episode three because I was like, no, that's enough sadness. We don't we don't need to go on. It, but it, I did watch Philadelphia. It is sad, but you know, I got there. It's heartbreaking how I was a lot younger as well. And then Ben and I had watched it not that long ago, maybe five years ago or something. The soundtrack is amazing absolutely Mm. amazing I know we're talking about the film but the soundtrack is also absolutely amazing and it's just like you're saying it's such a heartbreaking film is it just totally fiction was it based on a true story so I'm hoping you're going to tell us indeed I will but well let's do a summary of the plot first of all because there might be people that haven't seen it go and Um, watch it go go and watch it yeah well I'm about to do loads of spoilers through it so that might make it easier we should say that then. Spoiler alert, if someone has been living under a rock and has not yet seen Philadelphia, because what do you know what year it came out? I think it was 1993. Okay, spoilers from a film that came out in 93. Yeah, it was 1993 it came out. Okay. So, you know, if you haven't seen it by now, then you deserve to hear the spoilers. The starts I'm going to take. Right, so the summary is quite long, so do interject at any point. But it focuses on a character called Andrew Beckett. He's a senior associate in a law firm in Philadelphia, and he hides his sexuality at work along with his HIV status. And then one day, 
A colleague notices a mark on his forehead. Andrew says, oh, that was from a racquetball accident. But the mark is actually a lesion from a condition called Carposi sarcoma, which is a type of cancer. And it can be more prevalent in people with a suppressed immune system, including those with AIDS. And one of the characteristics of the condition is like these purpley brown marks or patches on the skin. And it is, it's classed as an AIDS-defining illness. It's not curable, but it is treatable through taking HIV meds, which, of course, help boost the patient's own immune response to it. But in the early days of um, HIV, and again, referring to It's a Sin with Donald, and he had he um, did, yes. marks yes. on him, didn't he? So, um, yes, it was much more common, I would say, in the early days of HIV than it is now. We rarely see that now, do we? No. And that was that was one of those things, wasn't it, that knew about because of films like Philadelphia. I think that's what everyone still thinks is still the case, but it's not. Yeah, exactly. Now, Andrew, obviously, is very conscious of the lesion that his work colleague has pointed out, which in itself is a bit rude, isn't it? Commenting on someone's appearance. So he starts to work from home more um, and he's working on a big case. He finishes it. He drops the paperwork off at the office with instructions for his assistants on where the paperwork should be filed. But it's misfiled and is only just submitted to the court on time. And the next day he's fired for incompetence. Really, really harsh. It was really stressful, actually, watching that part of it. I remember his secretary so upset. No one can find it. And they're constantly calling him. 11th hour, they finally get it there, don't they? Absolutely. Now, he believes, Andrew believes, the real reason for him being fired is because of his sexuality and that his firm has guessed that he has AIDS. So he starts to look for a lawyer to take on his case. And he contacts, you know, 10 different lawyers, one of whom is called Joe Miller, played by Denzel Washington. You know, when he meets Joe and talks to Joe, Joe's so worried that he might have called AIDS from his brief contact with Andrew that he goes to his own doctor to check if he's infected and the doctor explains the roots of transmission good way of educating the audience yes and having and having a character that people could relate to at the time as we know even now there's lots of misinformation and a lack of knowledge around HIV but back then my goodness that that would have been crazy so as you say it's a really great way of people going oh I thought that or I felt that way. And actually, here's his doctor explaining that, no, shaking hands is not going to. <laughs> there is absolutely no way you're going to be contracting from that. Exactly. Exactly. Andrew doesn't find a lawyer who will represent him, of course. So he decides to represent himself. And he's in the library one day and he's researching his own case of discrimination. Librarian comes over, tells him they found another case of AIDS discrimination. And everybody in the library within earshot gets really, really awkward because he doesn't look well by this point. And one of the people that's within earshot is Joe Miller. And he sees the reaction of the people around him and realises it's not dissimilar to his own experiences of discrimination around the colour of his skin. So he decides to take on the case. It goes to court. The defence argue that Andrew brought his diagnosis on himself by having gay sex. Can you believe that would be used as a defence? It's awful. I mean, along with the allegations of incompetence to do his job. But they're saying the two kind of go hand in hand. And during the court case, it's disclosed that one of the partners that originally asked Andrew about the mark on his forehead had already represented a woman who'd contracted AIDS through a blood transfusion. So he was familiar with the lesions that he saw on Andrew's forehead as being an AIDS defining illness. The partner in question, who has to take the stand about this, disagrees with what Joe Miller is saying. And then, oh, there's that scene where he asks um, Andrew to unbutton his shirt to reveal the lesions to kind of evidence that, you know, these lesions are very recognisable. Prosecution is arguing that if you've worked on another case relating to AIDS, then you'd be aware of what these lesions are because they're recognisable. And therefore, you would know that Andrew has AIDS. But oh, it's, it's a very heartbreaking scene. Andrew doesn't want to do it. Oh, As the trial progresses, Andrew collapses and is taken to hospital. Whilst he's in hospital, the jury on his case vote in his favour and he's awarded damages. And then Joe Miller visits Andrew in hospital to tell him the good news. And that's when he touches Andrew for the first time. You know, Andrew's got um, an oxygen mask on, hasn't he? Mm. And Joe, he takes it off to speak to Joe and then Joe puts the mask back on, back on his face for him. And that kind of proves he's completely overcome his prejudice around HIV. Shortly after that, Andrew passes away. You missed the bit out where they have that amazing party with Andrew oh. and his partner and Joe Miller takes his wife and they have like the most wonderful time and they dance together and then they listen to that opera afterwards. 
I'm literally doing a blow by blow spoiler of the film. No, no one's going to oh. watch it now. It's fine. Well, I didn't like. Well, I didn't. As, as I was putting it together, I was like, I mean, this is really long anyway. We could just talk about the plot of the film for the whole twenty five <laughs> minutes. So yes, that is not everything by any means. Um, but hopefully, it gives an essence of just how good that film is. It's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. Now, uh, as I've said, it was released in 1993, and you know how cynical I am. So I was thinking, was Hollywood just capitalising on the epidemic or were there other motives for producing the film? Yeah, because that's right in the, I was about to say heyday. That is not a phrase we should use. <laughs> um, it was right in, you know, in the 90s when we're in the midst of the HIV AIDS epidemic. So actually to put a film out, like you're saying, were they trying to tackle an issue? Were they being brave or were they being greedy or a bit of both? Well, exactly. So we need to look at the director who was called Jonathan Dem and his producing partner, Ed Saxon. They just won an Oscar for Silence of the Lambs. Oh, so you know, of... one of my favourite films. Oh, I know. And another film I've seen. Have you actually seen it? Yes, I oh. have watched it. Right. The other day, my friend said to me, you must stop listening to so many crime podcasts. You're scaring yourself and watching so many crime documentaries and films. And I was having a little FaceTime with her and she said, what are you doing at the moment? <laughs> to say I'm watching Silence of the Lambs. Oh. She was like, it's four o'clock on a Saturday. Why? But I love it. It puts the lotion in the basket. Oh, no, no, no. Honestly, I have seen Silence of the Lambs. I wouldn't watch it again because I've seen it and it's too it's dark. Amazing. Of course, it's very, very dark, but it's so well done. I didn't know that it was the same director. Yeah, same director, same duo. And they're at the peak of their careers. You know, they'd won an Oscar. They could afford to take a risk in directing Philadelphia. And it was a risk at the time because, like we said, stigma in America towards HIV, as everywhere else, was huge. But they both had personal reasons for wanting to be involved, having both had close friends with AIDS. And they were both very aware of the rising death toll in the States. So when the film was released, nearly a quarter of a million people in America had died because of AIDS. Much bigger numbers than the UK. Obviously, their population is, is much, much bigger. But they're aware of this and they're aware that, they, you know, they've, they've got friends affected by it. So that was kind of their motivation. I know it's not a public service message. But it sort of is in some respects, isn't it? My goodness, if you're going to try to educate as many people as possible and dispel myths and help them understand what better way than in cinemas all over the country, all over the world. I know, I think it's really clever. Now, they needed a screenwriter and they chose someone called Ron Nicewanner. He was openly gay and also a gay rights activist. And he generally worked on films about homophobia and homosexuality. And Philadelphia really put his name firmly on the map, really, because it earned him nominations at the Academy Awards, the Golden Globes, the BAFTAs. So between them, they then have to pitch the film to a studio head and the film studio that they chose agreed to their concept that they should make a movie about AIDS that should be made. And apparently at the time, there were other movies in development around AIDS, but all of them had a heterosexual main character. Oh, I know <laughs> What face is a picture? Do we know why? I think because they felt that would be more palatable viewing. <sighs> I know. I don't know what's going on with some people. Don't get me wrong. I, we, obviously, we know HIV affects anyone. So we're not saying they shouldn't. But it seems odd that all of the, the other films, there are no other ones that have anything other than a heterosexual main character. It's madness. So their main, main character was gay. Uh, and that's what sprung it for them. That's how they got studio back in. Because, you know, their film is realistic. Now, we know the stigma associated with HIV uh, was huge. So how did they attract stars to appear in Philadelphia? How did they? Maybe some people that had been touched by HIV, their friends had been, their family, maybe something like that, or who wanted to help educate the wider community. I think probably that comes into play. I mean, Tom Hanks is lovely, isn't he? So he plays Andrew Beckett and he, he's just amazing and an all-round good egg. I would say. Literally my husband's favourite person ever and he's always wanted a Tom Hanks party. Oh. So maybe when he's 40, I'll throw him a Tom Hanks party. He's forever talking to people about it. What would you come as? Which character? Because no one can come as the same character in his thing and he goes through all of the different Tom Hankses that you could possibly be. Wow. Yeah. Oh, well, he's obviously he plays the lead character, but in order to attract other people, basically, you know, it's an Oscar-winning win team that are directing it. And they're riding 
off the back of the success of Silence of the Lambs. So everyone wants to work with them. Of course they do. Uh, but not Daniel Day-Lewis, because he turned down the role of Andrew. Uh, it doesn't say why. And this is off Wikipedia. So, well, you know, it might not be true. Although I've always found Wikipedia to be fairly accurate. Mm. But I wonder if he regretted turning it down. If it was for no other reason other than you are just a bit unsure on how it would affect your career, then yes, I would be gutted. But if he had prior commitments, then... You can't do it all, can you? Oh, now when Nice One, when he's writing the script, he was very clear that he wasn't looking for an audience that knew somebody with AIDS. He wrote it in the hope that the audience would have more in common with Joe Miller, which I think is a very polite way of saying that they wanted to challenge not just stigma towards HIV, but also homophobia. That's his audience when he writes it. Imagine that challenge. Like you're saying, there has to be a character that people relate to. They have to want to go and see this film. They're they're using their money to go and see this. What an amazing way to challenge people. I think it's really clever. And I think, yes, it has wider appeal because of that. Although perhaps when you go and watch it, or when people went to watch it in the cinema, they wouldn't have realised that. But it probably made them think... I feel like in Philadelphia, you're seeing the story from, obviously from Andrew Beckett's side, but also from Joe Miller's. You sort of follow them Mm. both, don't you? So it's not like this is the goody and this is the baddie. And I think because it's presented in that way, it's not like, oh, I'm not like Joe Miller because he's awful, because it's not presented in that way. It's just presented like, as Joe, I think, says a few times, you know, he's just an average normal guy, he sees, doesn't he? He thinks what the general public think, so... Very clever. I mean, there are moments in it that do make you think. Um, and I was watching a clip of it the other day where Jay Miller's in a kind of pharmacy or like a drugstore and uh, he sees, uh, do you remember? Yeah. When the guy kind of chats him up or says, you know, if you're interested, I'm interested too. And he goes bananas about it, doesn't he? Yeah. And that makes you think because, you know, why would you assume that because you're representing someone that you're also gay? No, 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 no. And yeah. attitudes have moved on, thankfully. But back then, it really does illustrate how things were at the time. So it does its job. Now, why did they choose Philadelphia? Do you know? The city? Yes. I have no idea. Well, it wasn't really central, was it, to the HIV? The city of brotherly it? love, isn't it? Is that what it's called? Oh, I don't know about that. Oh, God, I'm going to have to Google that now. <laughs> I feel like I heard that in the film. Well, they were, I mean, they looked at lots of different um, cities, you know, New York, Boston, Chicago, all the usual big cities in America, I guess. The reason they went for Philadelphia is because there's a building there called City Hall. And that was exactly how they had envisaged the courthouse looking. So that's the only reason they've picked Philadelphia is because of the location of the courthouse. And that's why they named the film Philadelphia. Oh, wow. That's it. Nothing else to it. Well, sometimes it's hard. You can have too many like requests or, you know, things on your checklist. And I think that's a good one. Now, there's a very, um, oh, I read about a very poignant moment where the actress Mary Steenburgen, so for non-film buffs like me, she plays the mum in Elf. You know, the woman who discovers her husband's fathered one of Santa's elves. Yes. Doesn't yes. that sound ridiculous when you say it out? <laughs> yes. Buddy the elf stepmom. That's the one. Yes. And everyone's seen elf, right? It's, well, you probably haven't. It's not dark enough for of course you. course I've seen elf. Amazing. Oh, but it's a lighthearted film and completely could never happen in real life. No, but I do like lighthearted. Oh, OK. For like 10% of the time and the other 90% it's dark. Okay. No, do you remember we talked about this before? It's either like trashy, comedy, fictiony, or just darkness. Fair enough. So Mary Steenberg, and she plays the law firm's defence lawyer in Philadelphia. So she's the baddie, really, isn't she? She's trying to disprove Andrew's court case. Now, at the time that she was filming this, she had a very close friend who was dying of AIDS. And she talks to Jonathan, the director, about how difficult it is to film something that is so close to her own personal life. And she's not sure she can carry on playing the part. And Jonathan says to her, he's like, Mary, this isn't about AIDS. It's about everybody in this country is entitled to justice. They're entitled to their representation. So now you can completely understand they're not capitalising on the AIDS epidemic at all. They're challenging homophobia, HIV stigma, myths, lack of education. They're ensuring that those affected are given a voice and making sure those that aren't affected understand just how horrific it is for those that are. That's awesome. I love that they weren't (laughs) capitalising on it, but it was about so, so much more than that. 
So that kind of brings it all into context for me. You know, these are uh, people, very successful kind of directing duo who are really trying to get the message out to the public and address the kind of epidemic and, and the stigma in their own way. And it works really, really well. I feel like people need to still keep watching Philadelphia. And I know we bang on about it, but we'll never stop banging on about the fact that the stigma is still very real and very present. And actually, I think even in present day, it's quite relevant to watch Philadelphia. We've certainly come across an awful lot of HIV stigma directed towards our clients. And I remember people saying, I don't want that person in my car. Absolute insane things like that, that you're like, that's crackers. You just you don't want a positive person in your car because you're concerned about that risk. And that's in this day and age. The age old things, sharing toilet, sharing cups, sharing cutlery. It's crazy. It is crazy. I remember I think you were working at TVPS. We had a social work student. And when lunch was served, she was like, oh, do we do we have separate cutlery? Yes. <laughs> On her first day. And I just remember thinking, oh, no. I do a lot of work to educate her. And she came really good in the end. I think I was shocked at her lack of knowledge, considering this was going to be her work placement. You'd hope she would have done some research. But yeah, uh, when I first took the job, I know we've talked about this stuff before, but when I first came to work for TVPS, one of my friend's boyfriends, he was like, so do you have to get tested every six months? I was like, what, what, what for? He was like, for HIV. I was like, what do you think we all do together? (laughs) No. <laughs> what what is in your mind and he was just like oh no no just because you work there like honestly I was absolutely speechless I had that one of my friends when I'd had the job job offer but I hadn't accepted it and I was kind of meeting friends in the pub and I said oh god I've got this job offer I think I'm gonna go for it and he said the same to me I said aren't you worried that you'll catch it and I was just like <laughs> no for the same thing it's like my gosh what do you think we're doing it blows my mind that people still this is why films like Philadelphia are still so relevant maybe we should campaign for everyone to watch it again like a refresher course <gasps> we should re-watch it again oh but I've watched some of it for this and it's just so sad and my heart goes out to him and I'm willing him to stay alive oh no 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 <laughs> I've you, let's start a campaign but I'm not involved so I'm <laughs> opting out but every everyone else is gonna yeah yeah that's what I want to do I like it Oh, right. Okay. So the film, it's not without controversy and not so much from the public because I thought, oh, I wonder how the public, how it went down with them. No, it's more to do with the similarities to the lives of two different attorneys. So as you were saying, was it based on true life? Okay. So there was a a, a small element or you're, well, obviously you're about to explain. I don't know why I'm butting in. I'll just let you continue so there were two attorneys at the time Jeffrey Bowers was an attorney who sued his law firm in 1987 for wrongful dismissal was one of the first AIDS discrimination cases and then Clarence Kane he was fired when his law firm found out he had AIDS and he sued them in 1990 and won just before his death So I think the film might be an amalgamation of the two. Now, the family of Jeffrey Bowers sued the writers and producers of Philadelphia. So a year after Jeffrey had died, they were interviewed by a producer called Scott Ruddin. All above board, the family had their uh, lawyers with them, as you do. And the family said they were promised compensation if Jeffrey's story was used as a basis for the film. Now, Scott Ruddin, he wasn't involved in Philadelphia at all, but the family said there were 54 scenes in the film that were so similar to Jeffrey's life, they could only have come from their interviews. The film's defence lawyer said that Scott had abandoned his film project and didn't pass on any information the family had provided. But they did come to a settlement and the defendants, the film company, did admit that the film was inspired in part by Jeffrey's story. So, yes, elements of it are probably true or based on true life. I do like that they use the experiences of somebody. Obviously, I don't want to get into the suing and stuff. That's, you know, their business. But I love that they have used or borrowed bits of people's stories. Oh, I think so too, yes. I mean, it shows that this was going on in real life. You know, although it's a film and it's supposed to be based on fiction, there's an element there that, you know, this was happening to real people at the time. Now, we know that Philadelphia was a roaring success. It grossed 206.7 million worldwide and it cost 26 million to make. So they had a huge profit they made out of it. And it was the 12th highest grossing film in America in 93. Okay. 
and I go them. And then because, you know, we do like to tie these things back to being a heroic. So let's look at the impact of the film. So it was the first Hollywood big budget, big star film to tackle the issues of AIDS in the US, following on from the TV movie and the band played on, which we've talked about before. And it signaled a shift in Hollywood films towards more realistic depictions of people in the LGBT community. What an achievement. That is incredible. Yeah. So that was the impact. There's one last note to let you know about. So every film's got extras in it. The extras cast in this film included 53 people who were AIDS infected as of the time of shooting the film. I know, isn't that? That, Yes, I think that is amazing, especially because we've covered so many programmes and events and things where positive people have been pushed out and to have them involved and included, outstanding. Film came out in 93, it was said by the end of 1994, 43 out of those 53 people had passed away. And that kind of demonstrates the close link between fiction and fact that people were dying. So there you go. I ended on a bit of a sad note, sorry, but that's all you need to know about Philadelphia. Oh, thank you so much. It's so nice to know some of the background and especially from like some of the actors' perspectives. And I've actually got a little fact about Philadelphia. I'm not going to call it a fact. That was wrong. It's something I saw on TikTok. Oh. <laughs> um, so, I know. I was like, it's a fact. It's not. It's something I saw on social media. But I am actually going to go away and see if it is. So I had. there's a scene in Philadelphia and there's a gorgeous um, Paul Young. Paul Young? Neil Young. Oh. <laughs> That's a bit different, isn't it? (laughs) There's a lovely Neil Young song playing and they're watching home movies. I think it's after Andy's passed away. I'm not entirely sure. Yes, it is. Yes. And it's really lovely. And it's looking at when him and his brothers and sisters, they were little and he's like written, I think, on a stone or something, his name, Andy. And anyway, if you look, it's the same Andy writing that's on the boot on Woody in Toy Story. Look at your face. Have I blown your mind? No way. Honestly, I will double check it. I'm not saying it's a total fact. Please don't take it as a fact. But I'm sure when I watched it, it was a long time ago that I saw this and it was the same and they had taken that and it was like a a bit of a homage that they were paying. But let me go and double check. And if it is, I'm going to put images of it up. Oh, my goodness. How lovely is that? Wow. Do you know Tom Hanks, he probably contact us after this uh, podcast goes out. I mean, I hope he comes to Ben's Tom Hanks party as himself, because what more Tom Hanks can you get than actual Tom Hanks? Oh, imagine if he did. I think we should make that happen. Yeah. OK, there you go. That's a little mission for you. Can't get older <laughs> Tom Hanks. Um. Thank you so much for telling us all about that, because, yeah, like we said, it's a film that we all know really, really well was a huge success. People still talk about it. So to know some of the history is awesome. You're very welcome. I also can't wait for, and I'm sure everyone else can't, for the steel band ukulele keyboard extravaganza that is going to be your jingle. I wouldn't build that up too much if I was you. Okay, I'm going to send you the lyrics over this week. Because I don't we both that know there. that we'll get to the next recording and you'll be like, so? And I'll be like, what? And I'll have done nothing. I know. And I'll have prepared something as like a backup. You know what I might do, though? I mean, we could get our trustees to be a choir. Now you're talking. I reckon they've got good singing voices. We can show them how to harmonise. We can do that well. Right. So I'm off now <laughs> to draft an email to the trustees to say. <laughs> to let them know they're our new podcast choir. Amazing. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I will see you next time for more singing and history and heroes. Thank you for listening to HIV Hope and Charity. If you'd like to know more about the work that we do, visit tvps.org.uk. And please like, subscribe and rate the podcast if you enjoyed it. Mm